Hey everyone, this is Snoopy from Garden of Freedom. This is the long answer to the question about what we do about bugs uh, that are affecting our crops. So I talked about healthy plants and how that helps. I want to expand on that a bit. You gotta choose the right crop to increase your chance of having a healthy crop. So in our climate, which is a wet tropical climate, you know, it's very hard for me to grow, for example, Solanum tuberosa, which is Irish potato. So that, that is like a challenge for us because the climate is not suitable. But with the sweet potato, for instance, it's suited to this climate. So it's easier to maintain a healthy crop, which the bugs don't touch. Because mainly bugs will touch a crop that is unhealthy. So it's like nature's garbage collectors. In one way, you can see that insects are not like humans. They have different digestive systems. It's called trophobiosis. Trophobiosis. See, some insects uh, want more nitrates and they expel sugar. And some insects are looking for other chemical compounds in the leaf. And uh, some insects like grasshoppers prefer when, when the leaves are slightly dehydrated. Like, when the sap flow is low. So when you get grasshoppers, you usually know that the water management is wrong or that the, the fertilization is not correct because the sap is not at its prime physical condition. So we always try to focus on the right conditions for the plants so they have the, the best possibility to defend themselves. Because if you're going to try and kill these insects with uh, poisons or mechanical means, it'll take a lot of your time and it's going to become quite expensive. So trying to help your crops have the best defense possible is going to be the cheapest. It has been the cheapest for us. Like in the beginning, I tried a bit of like chili sprays and things like that. I don't think it did help anything. I've never tried anything systemic because it... it uh, contaminates the food, so I don't want to put it into our food system. So we basically try to focus on healthy plants and suitable crops for our climate and suitable crops for the year. So at the moment it's a dry season and behind me we have a love heart tomato or beef steak tomato, which, which grows lovely in our dry season. But during the wet season, uh, it doesn't fare too well. So in the wet season we usually grow smaller cocktail tomatoes or we, we grow Peruvian pipele folium, which is like the ancestral tomato, which is like tiny, tiny. I, I can show you later. So here everyone, here we have the, the smallest tomato in the world. So this is actually a, quite a big specimen here. So these ones go really well in the wet season for some reason, but see these ones here, the beefsteak ones, the vine does not thrive in the wet season. So that's why during the wet season we grow these Pepele folium. The closest ancestor to tomatoes that we have today, that I know of. Look at that beauty. But during the dry season, uh, this beef steak tomato works perfect. Um, for the sweet potato, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, the sweet potato grown right here, a feral one. So it gets insect damage like this. This is mainly from grasshoppers but it doesn't affect the yields like usually. It's, so it's not something that I stress a lot of, about. You know, this usually means that there was a period of dry weather and I wasn't up on my water management or I was too late with adding compost or manures or whatever you use. Whatever cheap carbon, you know, mineral source you can get. I mean, we usually mainly see compost from the forest or our food scraps and human manure and things like that. So, I mean, when you start losing that much surface area of the leaf, you definitely start impacting sugar production quite a lot. Because in the crop, you know, the, the sugar that is created here by photosynthesis, it's getting less because there's less photosynthetic area. So if you get into this stage, you gotta try and figure out how can I support the crop to reduce this or to push new growth. So 
you can also forget about this damage it's gone and you can try to push new growth you know with different practices watering uh, correct the mineral balance or you, you can add compost or you know different methods you can try to correct the um, the light maybe there's too much sun maybe there's too little sun so it depends on the crop sweet potato loves the full sun if it's in the shade it will climb up to the sun so you gotta try and get as much sun you can to the sweet potato but for some uh, some tropical plants like the okinawan spinach we always get a better crop when it's in uh, partial shade and usually when it's the sun it's the leaves usually get slightly dehydrated and a bit burned and then the grasshoppers eat it and then we don't get much yield you know, we want to eat it, we don't want the grasshoppers to eat it. But I mean, if, if, if you're in a hard, uh, hard situation and you have to kill insects, I'm not against that because I think that growing food for your own family precedes, you know, the kindness towards the insects because, I mean, common species, but I, 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 I will choose humans before insects. So if, if you need that to feed your family, I don't see any more issue with that. But the best is always going to be to support the crop, you know, by having a proper soil or proper conditions for the crop. Um, and you can also learn more about the uh, insect olfaction and also learn more about trophobiosis. And then, then you can start uh, observing the insects in your garden, in your food forest, and see which insects are going for crops at a certain time or why, and you can maybe figure out why they are that, doing that. You know, like aphids, for instance, expel the majority of the sugar at the back, and usually ants are there to like eat that sugar that they expel, because those aphids are usually after the nitrates. You know, so if, if if you have fertilized wrong with a high nitrate fertilizer and you haven't balanced it up with ammonium, it could happen that the, the nitrate to ammonium ratio in the plant sap is off and that will attract the aphids because of their olfaction system, like because of the way they smell. I mean, they don't, it's, it's maybe on a molecular level or like a electromagnetic level. But see, there, there are some uh, from a magnet. These are managers are telling you that the, the balance is off and something should be done. So like, I mean, these tomatoes look healthy. There, there is no systemic pesticide here and we're surrounded by a lot of nature. So we have a lot of uh, herbivore, 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 herbivore insects, but we also have a healthy predator population. So which, which we try to take care of, you know, we have small buckets with water you know, that the dragonflies can breed in. Um, we have other like breeding areas for predatory insects, like parasitoids, parasite insects. Like we have, uh, like it's a, um, a, a lot of the system is a food forest. So there's a lot of shelter and breeding ground for predatory insects, you know, parasitoids and also ones that just eat the insects. So having that can reduce the, insect damage on your crops but it will probably not be enough if your crop is not happy where it is you know most crops has a specific habitat they like so studying like uh, i mean you, you can go on to many websites like plant encyclopedias and you and you can try out like so tomato is solanum uh, like like osperum or something like that Solanum lycosperum, and then you can Google that into these. Um, you can you can type it into these encyclopedias, and you can see where these plants originally came from. And then you can try to figure out what conditions they prefer. You know what type of soil? Do they prefer calcitic soil? Do they pr prefer like uh, more like uh, iron rich, like clay soil? What uh, are, are they growing in areas that get like frequently inundated, like flooding? Maybe they, they actually absolutely thrive on a lot of water or maybe it's a plant that absolutely doesn't thrive with a lot of water. Uh, so when, when, when we take this, all these, these plants from all around the world, we might lose track of where they came from. Oh, that was a big branch. 
So, but, but they came from somewhere where they evolved or they were thriving for probably like thousands, hundreds, thousands of years. Who know? Who knows? So trying to understand the background where this plant came from can help a lot. It can help a lot. It, we do that especially with our food forest trees. You know, durian for instance, it comes from the equatorial region of the world. Uh, in Borneo specific, and it is pretty much constant rain all year round. And like, not, it doesn't rain all the time, but it's like frequent rain throughout the year. So it's, it's classified as a rainforest climate. So here we have a monsoon climate, we have a dry season. So during the dry season, we are forced to irrigate the, the durian, or we're, we're forced to add other means of moisture retention methods, like mulches, things like that, because they are just not adapted to monsoon climate. But jackfruit, for instance, come from a monsoon climate in southern India or other parts of like Kerala and things like that, where it's monsoon climate. So they, they handle the drought very well. No sign of distress. But durian, we have to manage, manage that uh, part of the year when it gets drier in the soil. So whatever crop you have, try and study it. Learn where it's come from originally and try to mimic those conditions as much as you can. Water is very important. So I, I think that was pretty much it. Uh, I tried to find some insects actually to show you, strict insects. I actually couldn't find any. Uh, maybe another video, they're pretty cool. They're like long, long, thick insects like that. They look like a praying mantis. So, yep, something to think about in this video. I hopefully it was informative. Ask me more questions. And I hope you guys have good, good success in your gardens and in whatever journey you're on. Take care, stay strong.